Hello, history friends! Today's subject is an object from our collection. This teeny tiny tin. What could it be for? Well, it's got a lovely picture of some knights on the front, and then there's a little mountain here, and then right in the corner there's a teeny tiny little castle. Ah! There's also some manufacturing information on the front about a rubber company, and then some stuff on the back about preventing disease. But aside from that, pretty much nothing else. Without context, it would be easy to confuse this tin for a tin of mints, or a matchbox, or maybe even a container for phonograph needles, rather than, say, a condom wrapper, which it is. This little box dates from around 1953, when buying or selling or even talking about its contents was still technically illegal in Canada. But somebody bought it! So here it is, hiding in plain sight, more common than you'd think, but never mentioned by name. Which is the history of condoms in a nutshell. So, in honor of the season of romance and National Condom Month, let's learn some facts about prophylaxis. For as long as we've been having sex and babies, humans have been trying to separate the sex part from the baby part. Apologies to any babies watching this, it is what it is. We've tried everything you can imagine. Pastes of honey and crocodile dung, sponges made of wool or linen soaked in vinegar, and various potions, ointments, herbs, spells, and amulets to a greater, and mostly lesser, degree of effectiveness. Ancient evidence for sheaths for your equipment, internal or external, is vague, murky, and often pseudo-mythological. Ancient Egyptian doctors recommended that men wear linen sheaths over their genitals, but it was to prevent bilharzia, a parasitic river worm common to the Nile, and there was no evidence that it was used to prevent pregnancy or STDs. There are theories that the ancient Romans used animal bladders and intestines to prevent pregnancy and protect against disease, but again, no hard evidence. The first documentation of a condom used for sexual purposes comes to us from 16th century Italy, and for good reason. Sexually transmitted diseases were not new, but in about 1495, syphilis arrived in Europe and began rampaging its way across the continent. Suddenly, an effective condom was the difference between life and a slow, agonizing death. In 1564, an Italian physician named Gabriele Fallopio, discoverer of the fallopian tubes, wrote about a linen sheath which could be slipped over the penis to prevent disease. According to him, over 1,100 men had used his method, and not a single one of them got syphilis. Yay! Later recipes for similar sheaths recommended that they be soaked in a mixture of protective chemicals, including wine, tree resin, and that old standby, mercury. Meanwhile, in Asia, men were using sheep intestine or oiled silk paper. In Japan, you could get the kabuta gata, a sheath made of fine leather or polished tortoise shell. Some of these were full length, but others, called glands condoms, were only a couple of inches high and sat on the end of the penis like a jaunty little bowler hat. As you can imagine, these types of short condoms could be problematic, as they could fall off during use or even get lodged inside your partner. But the best and most popular wrapper, at least in Europe, was animal membrane. This usually meant sheep or goat intestine, or sometimes the swim bladders of fish. The version made from ox intestine was also called gold beater's skin, and had dozens of industrial applications, including as a barrier between sheets of beaten gold leaf, hence the name. By the 18th century, condoms in the West were doing a booming trade in cities. Known as armor, preservative machines, assurance caps, or English overcoats, as well as condoms, they could be bought from taverns, barbershops, theaters, or street vendors all over Europe. Two notable suppliers were Mrs. Phillips and her rival Mrs. Perkins, who both owned condom warehouses on Half Moon Street in the Strand, London. Ubiquitous as they were, most of these condoms were still only available to the rich. Turning a piece of sheep gut into a working prophylactic was a laborious, time-consuming process, and that was reflected in the price. If you were desperate and short of cash, you could always go to Miss Jenny, also of London, who washed out discarded condoms and sold them cheaply second-hand. Once you had managed to purchase one, using a skin condom was also complicated. The skin usually had to be soaked in water or saliva before use to soften it up. This sheepskin condom from Sweden, for example, comes with its own instruction manual, written in Latin, which recommends soaking the condom in warm milk. Once it was on, the condom had to be tied at the base with a ribbon to stop it from moving around too much. 
After use, it had to be very carefully washed out, rolled up, and tucked away in a box for next time. Then in the 1840s, possibly Thomas Hancock, but also maybe Charles Goodyear, yes, the tire guy, patented flexible vulcanized rubber, which was quickly put to use making condoms. Yes, they were heavy and awkward, and they had big seams running up the sides, which made them less comfortable compared to animal condoms, but they were also more reliable, cheaper, and longer lasting. For the first time, working class people could afford condoms, and they were the most popular form of birth control by the end of the 19th century. But of course, not everyone was happy with all this prophylacting and contracepting. Throughout all of this, there was a steady hum of disapproval in the background, mostly from religious authorities who saw any form of contraception as sinful. In the imagination of the general public, condom use in particular was associated with prostitutes, adulterers, and the generally morally suspect. Toward the middle of the 19th century, this hum became a roar of indignation, and various laws were passed restricting people's access to birth control of any kind, including condoms. In 1873, the Comstock laws were passed in the United States, banning the public advertisement of any kind of contraceptive and prohibiting the sale of condoms through the mail. In 1892, Canada passed even more stringent regulations, which stated, Everyone is guilty of an indictable offense and liable to two years imprisonment who knowingly, without lawful justification or excuse, offers to sell, advertises, publishes an advertisement of, or has for sale or disposal any medicine, drug, or article intended or represented as a means of preventing conception. And that's how things were for about 20 years. And then, as usual, World War I showed up and things began to change. Suddenly, governments were picking up masses of young, healthy men and transporting them to foreign parts. And that meant that they had to keep those young men, and their foreign parts, healthy. At least until you could chuck them into a hail of machine gun bullets. As with any war, prostitution and venereal disease were rampant. The German and French armies, ever pragmatic, supplied official brothels and condoms to their troops. Meanwhile, the British and Americans worried that providing condoms would only encourage naughty behavior. Instead, they stood firmly on their principles and equipped their soldiers with the best prophylactic of all, shame and self-restraint. Which worked about as well as you would imagine. Predictably, venereal infections became widespread. 5% for the Brits, and from 15 to as high as 25% for the Canadians. So why do the Canadians have so much venereal disease? Well, aside from our inherent rugged lumberjack-esque sexiness, it was probably because one, Canadian and Dominion troops couldn't go home to wives and girlfriends, and two, they were paid better and therefore could afford more prostitutes. In the face of this epidemic, British and Dominion forces finally gave in and began providing their troops with condoms and other prophylactic measures by the end of 1917. In 1918, the Comstock laws were overturned in the United States, and condoms could be legally sold and advertised specifically for the prevention of disease and not pregnancy. This rule applied far into the 20th century. You'll notice that our tin is very insistent about how much it is for the prevention of disease and definitely not for the prevention of babies, heaven forfend. In 1920, latex, or rubber suspended in water, was invented, introducing condoms that were thinner, lighter, more durable, and which lasted for five years, where the old rubber condoms had only lasted for three months. Condom sales doubled in the U.S. in the 1920s, and they began to be sold in sleek, exciting packaging, with exotic names like Chic, Shadows, Salome, Carmen, or Velvet. During this time, Canada was still technically functioning under the 1892 contraception laws, in 1936, a birth control activist named Dorothea Palmer, member of a family planning organization called the Parents Information Bureau, was arrested for giving out birth control advice and methods, including condoms, in Ottawa. In 1937, Palmer was acquitted on the grounds that her actions had been in the interest of the public good, and afterward, no one was arrested for distributing public information about birth control. Physical methods, however, were still technically illegal for preventing pregnancy, even though condoms were widely distributed to soldiers during the Second World War and often widely used by the public. 
1960, about seven years after these were purchased, the last person was convicted under the 1892 Act. Harold Fine, a Toronto pharmaceutical supplier, was arrested and fined $100, the equivalent of about $890 today, for repackaging, advertising, and selling condoms imported from England. Condoms like these weren't fully legalized in Canada until 1969, when cultural changes finally began to thaw our relationship with birth control. Condom use actually dropped in the 1960s and 70s as people began to rely more on the birth control pill for contraception. But then, the arrival of AIDS in the 1980s made condoms a necessity once again. And today, we can buy condoms anytime we want, and we don't have to pretend they're only for medical reasons. They come in a rainbow of colors and thicknesses and lubrications and shapes and textures. In 2019, the global condom market was worth about $8 billion US and is only projected to <clears throat> swell in the future. So however you're celebrating Valentine's Day this year, please do it safely. And remember that while modern love can be complicated, at least it no longer involves mercury or soaking a distended sheep's appendix in a bowl of warm milk. Unless that's what you're into. Enjoy! I'm going to pin my medal on the girl 